It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce to you the Honorable Marsha Turnus, former Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court. Chief Justice Turnus was appointed to the court in 1993 and was selected by her peers to serve as Chief Justice in 2006. She was the first woman to serve as Chief Justice in the history of the court. In 2010, after more than 17 years of distinguished service, Chief Justice Turnus was the target of a concentrated campaign by opponents of same-sex marriage to defeat her in a retention election. During the previous year, she had joined a unanimous court in striking down as unconstitutional an Iowa law that restricted marriage to a man and a woman. In the aftermath of that decision, special interest groups outside of Iowa spent over a million dollars negatively campaigning against Chief Justice Turnus and two of her colleagues, who were also up for re-election. Notably, neither Chief Justice Turnus nor her fellow justices responded to such attacks or even campaigned affirmatively for re-election. Unfortunately for Chief Justice Turnus and the state of Iowa, the negative campaign succeeded and she was forced to leave the bench in December of 2010. She has since returned to private practice in Des Moines, focusing on appellate and litigation consulting and arbitration, and is a frequent lecturer on judicial independence, the politicization of the judiciary, and reform of the criminal justice system. She also serves as the director of the Tom Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement at Drake University. In May of 2012, Chief Justice Turnus, along with her two former Supreme Court colleagues, received the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. They were selected, quote, in recognition of the political courage and judicial independence each demonstrated in setting aside popular opinion to uphold the basic freedoms and security guaranteed to all citizens under the Iowa Constitution, end quote. To me, that statement epitomizes what a judge should be, and it could not be a better description of the type of judge that Chief Justice Turnus was. It is my distinct honor to present to you Chief Justice Marsha Turnus. Thank you very much for having me today. I have been so favorably impressed with the University of Georgia. Lonnie, you've been great, and so has Lisa. And it's uh, really a, a privilege to be here at your annual symposium. Certainly the topic for this year's conference, ethical and professional issues facing the bench, is very timely. Since I was first appointed to the bench, I have written down here 20, yeah, 21 years ago. I don't think there's ever been such a pervasive challenge for judges and judicial candidates to maintain the dignity of the bench and the people's trust in the integrity of court decisions than there has been in the last five to ten years. And as you know, I've been asked to address this subject because I personally experienced this challenge in 2010 when uh, I was up for retention in Iowa. I faced the question how do I keep my judicial office and at the same time preserve the respect of the citizens of Iowa for the Iowa Supreme Court and the impartiality of our decisions? So I've been asked today to talk about my experience in the 2010 retention election and reflect on how the judicial election process colors citizens' views of judges and the decisions they make as well as the impact a political selection process has on judicial decision making. I hope my remarks will provide a context for the panel that will follow after lunch where the ethical challenges presented by campaigning and campaign financing will be discussed. Before I review or talk about what happened in Iowa, I'd like to just kind of set a context by reviewing some of the bedrock principles upon which the American judicial system is built. And it's already been alluded to earlier that the foundation of America's justice system is obviously the rule of law. And there's many ways uh, that this term has been defined, but the one that I think most appropriately describes the rule of law and that I'm going to use as a reference today is the definition that says it's a process of governing by laws that are applied fairly and uniformly to all persons. Because the same rules are applied in the same manner to everyone, the rule of law protects the civil, economic, political, and social rights of all citizens, not just the rights of the most vociferous, 
the most organized, the most popular, or the most powerful. Applying the rule of law is the sum and substance of the work of the courts. But we have a justice system governed by the rule of law only when we have an independent or a fair and impartial judiciary. And when I speak of independence or fair and impartial in this context, I'm referring to a judiciary that is committed to the rule of law, independent of, free of, outside influence, whether that influence is political or social or the judge's own bias, preference, or interest. So I'm using the word independent, independent differently than I think was being used this morning where they were talking about judges doing their own thing. Really just the opposite. Independence in this context is adhering to the rule of law, free of any outside influence. Without an independent judiciary committed to the rule of law, citizens are deprived of an impartial tribunal and are at risk of receiving a decision that is not based on a uniform and fair application of the law, but rather perhaps on public opinion or rigid ideology, or maybe to achieve an outcome that will curry favor with voters and potential donors. While I talk about these concepts in rather theoretical terms, I can tell you that they're not theoretical to me because we experience them up front and personal in Iowa. And I'll do a disclaimer here. That experience doesn't make me the ultimate expert on judicial independence, judicial selection, or how the politicization of the judiciary affects judicial decision making. But I will speak today to my truth. It may be a truth that isn't what you might agree with, uh, but I'm going to share it today with the hope that my experience after 17 years on the court and going through the most contentious retention election in uh, Iowa history, that I will provide some insight regarding judicial elections, the challenges they pose, and their potential effect on judicial decision making. Let me uh, just briefly describe how Iowa selects judges because it is a different process from the one used here in Georgia. And I'm going to make a little disclaimer here. I did look at how Georgia chose judges. I didn't look at anything else because I really didn't want to be influenced. I don't know if you have a, a politicized judiciary here. I don't know what kind of campaigns are run. I didn't want um, to start censoring myself in terms of my later comments by thinking, oh, they're going to think I'm criticizing them or talking about them. So I don't know what the situation here is in Georgia, and I've done that intentionally. But I do know that you don't have the same process. We have a commission-based, what's often called a merit selection process for choosing judges known as the Missouri Plan. It begins with a 15-member commission. Uh, half of those commissioners are laypersons appointed by the governor. Half are lawyers who are elected by attorneys licensed to practice law in Iowa. The most senior justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, other than the Chief Justice, serves as the chair of the commission. There's a lengthy uh, written application process. The commissioners screen applicants uh, who have applied, reviewing this information that uh, solicits uh, their background, education, professional skills, and experience. After public interviews of the applicants, the commission chooses three candidates, hopefully, theoretically, the most highly qualified, and those names are submitted to the governor. The governor then has 30 days to choose the new judge from among the commission's nominees. The other aspect of Iowa's selection process is retention elections. In a retention election, a judge runs unopposed, and the voters simply vote yes to retain the judge or no not to retain the judge. Historically, politics had played no role in judicial retention elections. Iowa justices had never found it necessary to form campaign committees, to engage in fundraising, or to campaign in any manner. I was actually on a retention ballot one year. After the election, somebody said, you know, how did you do on the election? And I'd forgotten I was even on the ballot. That's how much of a non-issue they were. But that changed in the 2010 judicial retention election. 
For the first time since Iowa adopted the Missouri Plan in the early 60s, as you've heard, special interest groups spent well over a million dollars to oust three members of the Iowa Supreme Court, myself included, who had participated in a 2009 unanimous decision legalizing same-sex marriage. In the 2010 retention election, judicial independence and the rule of law were directly at issue. And why do I say that? Well, obviously, removing three members of the court wasn't going to change our decision. And same-sex couples were still going to be marry, able to marry in Iowa. Undoubtedly, there was a retaliatory element in the campaign against us, a desire to hold the justice accountable for a decision many voters, many Iowans did not like. But the campaign was about more than just Iowa and its Supreme Court. According to the website of the out-of-state group leading the anti-retention effort, and it was probably the same group that did that ad, which, by the way, I've never seen that one before. I'm not sure where you got that. It was kind of a flashback for me. <laughs> but according to their website, the purpose in ousting the three justices from our court was to send a message, and now I'm quoting, in Iowa and across the country that the ruling class ignores the people at its peril. Clearly, these anti-retention groups wanted to send a message of intimidation to judges across the country, a warning that they should think twice before making a decision the people, or at least these special interest groups, did not like. Of course, these messages of retaliation and intimidation are utterly inconsistent with the concept of an independent judiciary charged with the responsibility to decide cases fairly and impartially under the rule of law. These messages suggest to judges that judges should be more concerned about public opinion and their own retention than about the consistent application of legal principles. Although the campaign against us was motivated by opposition to the court's same-sex marriage decision, as you've seen from the ad, the court's critics launched a much broader, well, no, I guess I'm not getting to that yet. I have a point before that. Their, their um, assault against the court at the, at the level of our actual decision, before we get to the extrapolating it to all these other issues, was to attack the power of the court to even decide the issue. Critics of the court argued the Iowa Supreme Court had overstepped its constitutional role by declaring a legislative act unconstitutional and thereby, according to them, overruling the will of the people. This claim was made notwithstanding that in the 160 years that our court had been in existence, we had ruled on the constitutionality of a legislative enactment over 1,000 times, never before having our power to do so or our constitutional role questioned. Ironically, one criticism that was never voiced throughout the 2010 campaign against us was that we had erroneously applied the law. Not once did I hear our opposition or read anything in any of their materials uh, that voiced a claim that we had misinterpreted the Iowa Constitution in finding that Iowa's Defensive Marriage Act violated the plaintiff's right to equal protection. Instead of challenging the legal correctness of our decision, the persons and entities providing funding and organizational support for the campaign against the justices played on voters' concerns regarding a wide range of issues, as you saw in the um, advertisement. They meant, would mention immigration, gun rights, um, just on and on, implying that if the court could do what it did to marriage, Imagine what they're going to do on all these other issues, which, of course, were not pending before us and probably never would be. They also liberally, liberally used trigger words to expand their voter base, playing on voters' suspicions and doubts about government and the judiciary in particular. You heard the legislating from the bench phrase. That's always a good one that these groups use. They repeatedly labeled our decision as judicial activism, the court as an arrogant judiciary, 
and the justices as elitist judges, and now I'm quoting, dictating from the bench which societal beliefs are acceptable and which ones are not. And as I'll discuss later, such fear-mongering and name-calling are all too frequent tools used by groups who seek to unseat judges. So what was our response to these demonizing attacks on the judiciary? The three of us decided early on not to form campaign committees and not to engage in any fundraising. Now that would have been permissible under the Iowa Code of Judicial Conduct, but we did not want to contribute to the politicization of the judiciary in Iowa by campaigning like politicians, even if it meant losing our jobs. First of all, honestly, we just weren't comfortable in that role, not at all. But secondly, we feared that by forming campaign committees that would solicit contributions, just like politicians do, that we would irreparably damage Iowans' view of the Iowa Supreme Court as being removed from partisan politics, that it would change the culture in Iowa forever. And we really felt a bigger obligation to the institution of the Iowa Supreme Court and the judiciary in general than we did about saving our own jobs. And if we would have been successful even, we were worried about the recusal issues that would arise that are so problematic when judges are asked to sit on cases where their impartiality might be questioned because the parties or the attorneys had participated financially in the judge's last election. So whether we won or lost the election, we believed that our decision to stay out of the political fray would best preserve our integrity and that of the Iowa Supreme Court. Now, we didn't totally sit on our hands. We did give numerous speeches prior to the election explaining the rule of law and the importance of a fair and impartial judiciary. But we always refrained from personally asking citizens to vote to retain us. As odd as that might sound, to us, it just seemed unseemly, and we didn't do it and we lost. <laughs> but enough about Iowa. Before I reflect on the impact of politicized judicial elections on judicial decision making and public confidence in the court, I want to talk just a little bit about how judicial elections in America have been politicized in general. In the past decade, the influence of corporate and special interest money has slowly infiltrated the process of selecting judges. The situation has only worsened since the 2010 Citizens United decision. A study by the Brennan Center just last year reports that in the 2011-2012 election cycle, 43%, 43% of all spending in judicial elections was by non-candidate groups, in other words, independent spending, 43%. That was up from 33% in the previous election cycle, 2009-2010. It's probably not surprising, at least it wasn't surprising to me, to know that the most expensive high court, high court elections in, in 2011 and 2012 were in, in four states where high courts were closely divided by party or judicial philosophy. That's an indication in my view that the spending was directed toward judges whose voting would be predictably in line with the interests of the contributors. Now I can't cite a study that supports my conclusion, I don't know that one's been done, but it seems a matter of simple common sense. In fact, a justice of the Ohio Supreme Court has said, and I'm quoting, I never felt so much like a hooker down by the gap bus station as I did in a judicial race. Everyone interested in contributing has very specific interest. They mean to be buying a vote. <coughs> An example of the impact of campaign contributions is perhaps best illustrated by a case you're probably all familiar with, Caperton versus Massey Coal Company. In that case, the president of Massey Coal Company made, an independent, made a $3 million contribution to an independent group that was supporting the election of Brent Benjamin to the West Virginia Supreme Court. Well, in case you don't know, well, why would a uh, president of a coal company spend their money in that manner? The coal company had a $50 million judgment against it that had been appealed to the West Virginia Supreme Court. With the help of Massey Coal Company's 
President Brent Benjamin was elected to the West Virginia Supreme Court. And when the coal company's appeal came before that court, Justice Benjamin refused to recuse himself. So but Justice Benjamin heard the coal company's appeal along with the four other four members of the West Virginia Supreme Court, and they reversed the $50 million judgment against the coal company on a vote of three to two, with Justice Benjamin voting to reverse. I want to be quick to say that I actually know Justice Benjamin. He served as the chief of that court for a while, and I got to know him, and, and we've been on panels together since then. And I don't doubt his personal conviction that he could serve as an impartial decision maker on that appeal. But the appearance of influence under such circumstances is undeniable, as the United States Supreme Court decided when it reversed the West Virginia Supreme Court's decision on the basis that the plaintiff had been denied his due process right to a fair tribunal. The tragedy in uh, situations like Caperton and politicized judicial elections in general is that they suggest to the public that judicial decisions can be bought and sold. They suggest to the public that judges are not necessarily neutral decision makers rendering fair and impartial rulings, but are put on the bench to favor particular interests or to vote along firm ideological lines. Certainly the election of judges has long been a subject of heated debate in the United States. Critics of judicial elections assert that money buys elections, that elections put justice for sale, that judicial neutrality is compromised, and that under these circumstances, the legitimacy of courts and court decisions are diminished. Voters share these concerns. Justice at Stake and the Brennan Center conducted a national poll just last October of 1,200 registered voters. These individuals were asked how much influence they thought campaign contributions made to a judge's campaign have on the judge's decision. Most voters, 59%, thought contributions had a great deal of influence, 59%. And another 28% believed that they had some influence. Only 2% of these registered voters thought they had no influence. Voters had similar views of the influence of independent expenditures by business and special interest groups in support of a judicial candidate. A majority, 53% of those polled, believe such spending have a great deal of influence on the judge's decision, decisions, and 34% thought independent uh, spending had some influence. Again, only 3% believed it had no influence. A 2007 poll of national business leaders conducted by the Committee for Economic Development revealed that 90% of business leaders polled were concerned that campaign contributions and political pressure will make judges accountable to politicians and special interest groups instead of the law and the Constitution. And at least one judge agrees in Michigan where the 2010 spending on two Michigan Supreme Court seats led judicial election spending in the nation that year. A former Michigan Supreme Court Justice had this to say about the influence of campaign money. Quote, it isn't just the appearance of impropriety. This money does have influence. Common sense tells you it does. I've been there, end of quote. But actually, it's not just the fact that campaign contributions are made that undermines confidence in the courts. The tone and negativity of campaigning, especially TV ads, also impact the public's confidence in their judges. In the 2011-2012 election, Michigan and Wisconsin voters saw terribly negative ads. <clears throat> Fear-mongering and name-calling were prevalent. A political consultant, I need some water. <laughs> Oh, there's some right here. Sorry. Hopefully I have a more pleasant voice now. <clears throat> 
A political consultant writing an op-ed piece about the Michigan race this, in this just last election observed, based on the commercials, you wouldn't vote for any of the six candidates for the Michigan Supreme Court, even if they were running for dog catcher. You'd be afraid they would abuse the dogs. Well, of course, because most of these negative and attack ads are funded by independent groups and not the judges campaign committee, I don't see how judicial ethics rules could impact the tenor of these commercials. While public confidence in the courts is a significant concern, I will acknowledge that there are competing values to consider. Supporters of judicial elections value the ability of the electorate to participate in judicial selection and their opportunity to hold judges accountable for their performance in office. I don't think I need to cite a poll to tell you that there is widespread support among the electorate for these values. While voters want to have a say in the selection of judges, one criticism that is common to all systems that use judicial elections is that voters do not have enough information to make sensible choices. In states where elections have been ho-hum affairs, the best and often only information is the bar plebiscite. In states where elections are hotly contested, the most widespread information comes from television advertisements, which typically address the professional qualifications of the candidates superficially, if at all, and are much more likely to be sensationalistic and sometimes downright misleading. So while voters may think they have control over who is on the bench, unless there's a credible and fair system for the evaluation of just judicial performance that can inform their choice, their control may really be an illusion. As I mentioned, allowing votes on judges is often justified as a way to ensure that judges are accountable for their decisions. But that simply begs the question, accountable to who? To whom? As a Minnesota judge wrote, should judges be accountable to those who shout the loudest or make the most threats? Should judges be accountable to the majority? If so, what happens to the rights of the minority? And what happens to a judge's responsibility to uphold the law and the Constitution? Before I move on, let me acknowledge that no system of judicial selection is immune from politics. Cronyism can creep into a point of systems and any judicial election, even retention elections, can be politicized, as we saw in Iowa. Only if those participating in the system are committed to a fair and impartial judiciary will the system operate in such a way as to select judges who will be fair and impartial. So as we evaluate the efficacy of the various models of judicial elections, which I understand the panel that follows will do, the quest isn't for the perfect system. In the end, the most that one can hope for is a system that maximizes the opportunity to achieve the goals we value most and that minimizes the chances that the system will be perverted away from those goals. As I've discussed, the increasing politicization of judicial elections has undermined public confidence in the integrity of court decisions. But the politicization of the judiciary also affects how those decisions are made. I was never a trial court judge, so I'm going to talk about judicial decision making from the vantage point of a Supreme Court justice who serves on a court that renders collective decisions. In my view, there are two aspects to the way courts of last resort approach decision making, and both are, are uh, impacted by the um, politicization of judicial selection. Drawing on the one economics course I took a gazillion years ago in undergrad, uh, I've, I've labeled these two uh, different aspects of judicial decision making the micro level and the macro level. I just made that up and, and it's been so long since I took econ, they're probably not even used appropriately, but those are gonna be my, la la my labels today. The micro level focuses on how judges as individuals approach 
their decision making. And the macro level examines how a court as a whole makes decisions, the dynamics of the collective decision making process. And I'm going to talk about each briefly. At the level of the individual judge, the conflict between accountability to voters or to campaign contributors on the one hand and judicial independence and the rule of law on the other hand is most acute. There's obviously a tension between the judge's obligation to apply the rule of law impartially and the judge's knowledge that his decision will be politically unpopular and perhaps leading to the public holding the judge accountable in the next election. Although this observ observation is really just common sense, it is borne out by the data. Several empirical studies have found that judges tend to favor campaign contributors in their decisions. The most recent study conducted by Justice at State confirmed a statistically significant positive relationship between campaign contributions from business groups and justices voting in favor of business interests. In addition to the various empirical studies that have been done, Justice at State conducted a national survey of almost 2,500 judges from all court levels. And this is a, a, a poll that was done in 2001 and 2010. It's, it, it's an old poll, but I would suspect that the results would be the same today. These judges were asked, how much influence do you think campaign contributions made to judges have on their decisions. 46% of these judges believed that campaign contributions do have some degree of influence on judicial decision making. Now I'm confident that most judges, if asked, would tell you that they try to put the interests of their campaign contributors or the impact their vote might have on their next election out of their mind when voting on individual cases. But as a former justice of the California Supreme Court acknowledged, he didn't know to what extent he was subliminally motivated by the thing you could not forget, that it might do you some good politically to vote one way or the other. As important as justice's individual decision-making process is, I think the macro level of decision-making is just as important. And again, I'm talking about the how the court functions as a group. Sometimes justices come to a Supreme Court already labeled Republican Democrat, liberal conservative, plaintiffs leaning, defense leaning. And once on the court, they feel a natural allegiance to others who wear the same label. And soon there is something like a camp mentality with members of the same camp voting almost as a block. I call a Supreme Court that functions in this manner a legislative style court. Justices usually vote along political or ideological lines and cases are decided by a majority vote with little, if any, meaningful discussion of the issues. Now, there may be arguments and there may be debates about the issue, but when I talk about meaningful discussion, I'm talking about a discussion that begins with an open mind and looks for the reasonableness and what the other person is saying. When I became the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court in 2006, I hoped that we would not be that kind of court. So I actually put the question to my fellow justices, what kind of court do we want to be? And the seven members of our court readily agreed that we wanted to be a court with integrity, one that was intellectually honest, and one that followed the rule of law. And we also discussed how we wanted to be treated by each other. And again, our agreement was fairly quick and easy. We wanted to be heard by our colleagues on the court. We wanted our opinions and views to be respected by the other justices. We actually brought in consultants who taught us how to listen to each other, really listen to each other, and how to have a respectful dialogue on issues, one in which we would seek to understand one another's position or thinking to look for the truth or reasonableness in what another, another member of the court was saying, not simply to listen long enough to be able to have an argument against what they were saying or, or to be able to criticize an opinion in opposition to our own. So I think there are two kinds of courts. The courts that operate like a mini legislature with justices deciding how to vote with little meaningful dialogue among court members and as I said, often along pre-established lines, and courts that actually make collective decisions where their perspectives, knowledge, and wisdom 
of all court members are brought to bear on the issue and are reflected in the court's ultimate decision. Now, I'm not suggesting that all courts always act one way or the other, but I really think in my experience and in talking to chiefs as we did at our conferences twice a year, that court cultures develop that cause a court to usually act either collectively or in a more polarized fashion. In my experience, sharing perspectives, knowledge, and views of the individual justices creates a collective wisdom much greater than the sum of its parts. I also believe the opportunity is highest on a court that functions in a collective manner for the issu issuance of legally and intellectually sound decisions based on the rule of law and not on the predilections of individual justices, their campaign contributors, or potential voters. The conclusion seems inescapable that the manner in which judges are selected has immense influence on whether a court will make decisions in a political fashion or in a collective fashion. When judicial candidates must campaign like politicians or commit to an established ideology in order to gain financial support for their election, they will carry that personality and commitment to represent a particular view into the conference room. That creates a very polarized atmosphere where respectful and thoughtful discussion is difficult. You need look no further than the Wisconsin Supreme Court to see the toxicity of politics on the court. The New York Times has described the Wisconsin court as a study in judicial dysfunction. Which brings me to an important point. Before we can discuss the efficacy of judicial elections, don't we need to ask what underlying values are paramount? Is fairness and impartiality most important? Or is judicial accountability to voters what counts? Do we value a neutral judiciary so all parties start out on an even playing field with the opportunity to convince the judges of the correctness of their position? Or is it okay that individuals and groups with power and money can use that power and money to promote the election of candidates who are predisposed to vote in ways that protect the interest of these individuals and groups? Do we want a court system that issues impartial rulings based upon the rule of law? Or is it acceptable for the prevailing political party or ideology to dictate court decisions as long as they hold a majority of seats on the court? I know in most states that I visit where judges are selected through contested elections, there is a strong attachment to the principles of participatory democracy and judicial accountability. And I'm not here to tell you that those are not principles that have value. As I've already acknowledged, there is no perfect system for judicial, judicial selection. But what I am suggesting is simply that the politicization of the judicial selection process produces a politicized judiciary, and that has an impact on justice. Politicized judicial elections encourage decision-making based on a judge's self-interest. They also have the potential for polarizing courts that must make collective decisions, discouraging thoughtful dialogue and the enlightenment such dialogue can produce. Finally, when judges act like politicians to get on the bench or to retain their seat, or even worse, when they decide cases like politicians in robes, courts justifiably lose their credibility with the people. In my view, these consequences of a politicized judiciary will not be avoided by codes of judicial conduct or recusal rules. Moreover, I believe the trend toward politicizing America's courts threatens the very foundation of our system of justice because when judges make decisions based on who they will please or displease or whether they will be reelected or retained, instead of based solely on what the law requires, we cease to be a nation governed by the rule of law. Well, I hope my comments dovetail into the panel that follows. And if they don't, it's too late. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the Bar Association sat on its hands. Sat on its hands. I don't think they, um, you know, this kind of thing had never happened before, and I don't think they even know, knew where to begin. And 
they, they did some public education, but no affirmative vote to retain. There was a group formed, uh, which included lawyers and members of the public, um, but it, it was so late in the game that they were not able to raise uh, enough funds to do TV advertising. They did some radio ads, and they might have done some robocalls. I really can't remember what they did. They probably raised a third of the money that was spent. And, and you know, you have to remember when you use these figures of what's spent, there's a lot of money that comes in and is spent that under the various uh, uh, reporting rules, we, you never know that it's, you know, where it came from or that it's even being uh, spent. So it's hard to really compare. Um, it's actually probably surprising the vote was as close as it was. The first question was, what, did anybody else do anything to support the court? or the justices. The, the next question is, is this like the Rose Bird situation? And when was that? Was I a baby lawyer then or was I already? I can't, when was that? 1986. 86, well, I, I wouldn't have been on the court, but I, I was aware of that. My understanding that that was, that certainly wasn't based on a decision. Um, it was based on capital. But it was based on an issue, right. Yeah. And I'm not really aware of what kind of, uh, arguments were made to get them um, not retained. Maybe somebody else here is more up to Well, and you know, even like I said, in our one single case, they never said we didn't get the law right. But their view was that when this kind of divisive issue comes up, the court should say, well, I guess because this is so controversial, uh, this group in front of us asking us to evaluate their right to equal protection isn't entitled to our judgment on it because it will make people unhappy, which was a notion I found very offensive as a judge. So we're done now. Yeah,